halls and palais of Britain's major cities. The sound was infectious, extravagant, and above all, loud, reproduced by massive sound systems, the sort of giant mobile discos to be seen during carnival time in Notting Hill. With each sound system came the toaster or MC, a sort of non-stop DJ, able to match the powerful beat of the music with equally rhythmic lyrics. I try to be humble at all times, you know? I don't really let things go to my head and I try to treat people how I'd like to be treated myself. So if this Rodigan, this interview is with Rodigan or with you or with Russ Kwame or Shawnee B, whoever it may be, you know, it's the same energy, the same vibe, the same level of respect, you know what I mean, all around. I was in the pop charts in 1986, you know? And I did Hello Darling that got into the pop charts. I had a few number one reggae tunes, you know what I mean? With Peter Honeygill and Lloyd Brown and Winsome, which are like straight. A couple of them were like Lovers Rock. One was a dancehall tune. So in the, the 80s, I had number one tunes in the 90s i've had number one tunes and then in the 2000s you know i i i i had a mama with the black eyed peas and then and then i linked up with the skins and when i look at you know the legacy it's a blessing you know what i mean because i try to just keep something happening because that's how music is you know one minute it's quiet and then the next minute boom it just, it just blows up so you know you have to keep um you have to keep going you've got to be versatile you know um and being able to adapt to the genre and and to artists and what i do is if i'm gonna work with somebody i kind of you know i do my research i look into their music I look, it's like if I'm working for a producer like Mad Professor or or whoever it is, I, I study what they do. I look into what they do and then I try to target that and, you know, and still be myself, but I still, you know, do my research in, into whoever I'm working with. You know, you got to be creative, man. And things just sometimes, it could be coming out of my bed something comes into my head i don't know where it comes from but it just comes into my head and then boom you know next thing i know i'm in the studio and then next thing i know i got a tune so the question is you know i think it's hard work trying to be creative versatile trying to be you know be able to adapt to to whatever the situation if you know people respect what you do you know and you feel comfortable in their surroundings or, you know, then for me, it makes me relax. It makes me, you know, be creative. And the ideas just come, you know, I just think it's something is a gift that I have when it comes to creating melodies and creating choruses, you know, um, and writing lyrics, you know, that's my gift. So I just basically, it just comes, I don't know where it comes from, but working with the youth, you know, like the skints and that, they love reggae music. And, you know, when you when you see Josh and Marcia and now they are, you know, you can tell they got a genuine love for the music. It was very enjoyable, um, but it was also hard work. You know, because obviously we had the sound equipment, um, which we had to pack into vans and drive up and down the country. And sometimes we had to just hop in the back of a van. So you could imagine, you know, driving from London to, to Leeds in the back of a van and coming out when it's, you know, it's time to go toilet. You, you used to bang the, the, the um, the van if we wanted to go toilet, you know what I mean? And they'll pull over and whatever. So it wasn't very glamorous. <laughs> it was hard, but obviously we did it for the love of the music. And then once the sound 
we offloaded the sound into the venue and the sound strung up. Then I got the opportunity to go on the microphone to perform. So, you know, and then we'd have to pack the sound down after playing for how much hours and whatever, and then load back the sound and then hop into the back of the van for the drive back. And then it's only when we reach home, you you know, you, 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 you're knackered, you jump in the bath or whatever, have a wash and then sleep. And then, you know, nine times out of 10, we'd have to do it again the next day. So it was fun. You know, it was a lot of young, young guys having fun, playing music, entertaining people. You know, the dances were, were amazing because obviously you'll have, sometimes it would be just us. Other times it would be us against Unity, us against Volcano, us against, in um, in the Midlands, it was Quaker City, Jungle Man, you know, up, up north in Manchester, you'll have sounds like Byron um, and sounds like that. In Huddersfield, we'll play at venues like the Fen Street up in Huddersfield. Yeah, man, it was it was a good, vibrant, you know, vibrant time, you know? Saxon was like an academy, you know? You had like five main MCs, which was Tipper Irie, Papa Levi, Rust, Rusty, Daddy Colonel, and Sandy, yeah? We were the, at one point, we were the first main MCs on the sound. Then you'd have singers like Maxi Priest, uh, Roger Robin, you know, um, Neville Morrison. All these guys have had have had number one tunes, you know what I mean? Um, and my little sister, Miss Irie, God rest her soul, you know what I mean? So you'd have, and, and that was in the middle of the mid 80s, 83, 84, 85. In the 81, and those in those times you had people like Peter King, um, you had a guy called Dirty Desi, you know, and this brother called Stout, another guy called Stout. You know, you had a whole heap of entertainers, you know what I mean? So, and those were just the entertainers. If, if you knew that Sweetie Irie was gonna clash the Raga Twins or whatever, you'd wanna go, you'd wanna go and see that. So people, people like that excitement. It's like, you know, Anthony Joshua and, and you know, and fighting, what's that name, Tyson Fury, you know? P people like that clash element and that, you know, cause they were, you know, to see who would win, who's got the best lyrics, you know? And so, you know, people miss that, you know? And even the sound system culture now, I don't even really like it that much. The way they play in the tunes them for like, you know, 30 seconds and then, then it's then switch. Yeah, I'm not really feeling that, that culture. Some people do it very well, you know? You've got sounds like Mighty Crown and all these kind of sounds. Um, they do it, they do it well, you know what I mean? And Stone Love and certain sounds do it well. I prefer the traditional style. Maybe be, I'm just showing my age, I don't know, but I prefer the sounds sound if you say that you're a sound system you should have a sound the music will never die man and the art form will never die even though they've cut off the dances and you know and stuff like that we're still um doing dub plates you know we're still um we're still managing to scrape by and finding things you know that can make us survive you know, and that's just, I think that's just in our nature and, and in our, you know, culture where we, you know, we, we got, we slip into survival mode. We're survivors, man. We're going to survive. And no matter what, you know, no matter what, how they try to oppress us, we're going to survive. And music's not going to die, man. Music can't die. You I mean, no matter what they do, you know, they can't, they can't stop the music. You know what I mean? And it can't stop us from performing and you know the mic can stop us in one sense but if there's always a platform where we can perform and bring the music to the people. <laughs> <laughs>